Good morning. It's great to be able to share with you again this morning. And uh, thank you for the opportunity, Tim. And uh, I'm looking forward to bringing some thoughts from the book of Nehemiah and sharing some things I feel God's put on my heart for the church. It's been really great to hear some snippets, little bits and pieces of the process that the church is going through at the moment in terms of seeking God, seeking to hear from him afresh and to understand the vision that he has for the church in this next season. I've also really appreciated being able to listen to some of the messages based in the book of Nehemiah and seeing what God would be speaking through that book. It may be 2,400, 2,500 years old, but Nehemiah has a profound and stirring message for us as the people of God. And it's difficult for us to imagine what those times must have been like. Um, The people of Israel were conquered by the Babylonians, and most of the people in the country were taken into captivity. This extended period of being conquered and forcibly removed from their own nation was allowed by God and came as a result of long periods of deep sin and wickedness from the kings of Judah and Israel right down to the normal citizens of the nation. It was sustained rebellion against God, repeatedly turning away from him despite the warnings and the pleadings of the prophets that God sent. But the book of Nehemiah also represents one of the great revival stories that we read about in the scriptures. Not only a revival in terms of the rebuilding of Jerusalem and a return to the the homeland for the people, but also a spiritual renewal. I picked up that those words, revival, rebuilding, renewal, are some of the key words for Christchurch at this time, this period that you are in. I've, um, I've heard this, this trio of words being mentioned, renew, restore, rebuild, renew, restore, rebuild. And I join with you in asking God to do that in Christchurch at this time. For our reading today in Nehemiah 9, we get a glimpse of what spiritual revival, spiritual renewal looked like in Nehemiah's day. And I think from this, the Holy Spirit has some aspects to highlight to us and to show to us what spiritual renewal and revival might look like for Christ Church as well. So from this and other passages of Scripture, we can build up a picture of what I've called or what one might call some essential ingredients for spiritual renewal, essential ingredients. And I think you see these right throughout church history. And if we had the time to look at moves of God in different parts of the world, you see these ingredients keep popping up in different ways. They look different in different countries and periods of time, but it's the same stuff over and over. The first one is, and this is really the non-negotiable, it's the big overarching ingredient for renewal, is God's mercy or the sovereign factor, you might call it, the sovereign factor, the, the bit that we cannot engineer. And really, spiritual renewal is always a sovereign act of God's mercy. And by the use of the word sovereign, I mean something that is of his greatness and power and done by him, not something that we have controlled. We can't make him do it. It's always out of his goodness, out of the love of his heart and by his might and in the way and the time of his choosing. Indeed, to have the tiniest move or desire towards God and renewal by him takes a grace that comes from him. So it is sovereign in in its entirety. And we don't come up with that. It's his initiative uh, that brings us to that place of wanting more of him. And so really, we start from a place of, of great humility and of dependence upon him, saying, God, out of your sovereign mercy, would you bring about renewal? But a second key ingredient for Uh, spiritual renewal or revival is that we need to seek after God. And uh, this is the part that we must play. We must step up to this. A Christian author and Bible teacher uh, called Gunter Krallman calls this the crucial factor. The crucial factor. And what I think he means by that is you have the sovereign factor, which is God's activity, but he's looking in the earth for the crucial factor, for people who will turn their hearts to him. It says in the book of Chronicles that the the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth, looking to strengthen those whose hearts are fully devoted to him. So he's actually on the hunt 
for people who will respond to that touch of the Spirit in their hearts and will incline themselves towards Him. So we don't get to simply sit back and wait to be revived. That's not really how it works. It's not a passive process. Nor can we think of it as being uh, business as usual, just more of what we're used to, more of the maybe the run of the mill that we have been accustomed to in our Christian lives. If we are serious about God moving and acting in our day, in our time, and in, in our church, in Christ church, and reviving his activity among us, reviving his activity in Bushmead and in Luton and beyond, we will earnestly seek after that. We will earnestly seek after that. One of the best known verses in the Bible speaks to this very issue. And in fact, it was foretold by Jeremiah in direct reference to how God would restore the people after their captivity, after their exile in Babylon. And it appears in Jeremiah 29, 10 and 11. And he says this, For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed in Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. Long before the people returned from exile, God was already pledging and giving his, his word that he would reveal himself to them. He would restore them in the future. That, that uh, period of exile and captivity was not the end of the story. It was actually a stepping stone to try to woo their hearts to him. But it was on one condition. Listen to those words. You will seek me and find me. That's an incredible promise. When you seek me with all your heart. So like I'm saying there in terms of the crucial factor, there's something of real intention. There's, there's a, a powerful statement there that if you will seek me with all your heart, you will find me. Well, I have a question for us this morning. What is it that you are seeking with all your heart? With all your heart. Is there something that you go after with all your heart? And is there anything you go after or seek after more earnestly or with greater determination than you go after God? Because what you seek is what you get. You've heard of that uh, computer term, WYSIWYG, what you see is what you get. What you put in is what will come out of a computer. Well, this is the spiritual uh, truth. What you seek after is what you will get. If you seek after the things of God, you'll get that. If you seek after the things of the flesh, that's what you will get. So if your passion is for pleasure and entertainment and fulfilling the fleshly desires, well, that's what you'll get. And in the end, the return on that is poor. Is your pursuit money and financial security in a place higher than you're seeking after God? Well, you might get the money. It may work out. You might get the financial security here on earth. But the ultimate return is so very poor. It's so very poor. Even though it seems like you might have riches, the return ultimately is poor. Friends, I want to urge you to make friendship with God the unequivocal number one pursuit of your life that you would seek after him. Make it far and away the thing that your best energy and your best thoughts and your best passion goes on. Whatever that looks like for you, if it's first thing in the morning, if it's the last thing at night, if it's the thing that you invest in with your finances or the thing that you, you spend your time on the most, whatever description of that there is that you seek to know and walk closely with Christ. And I want to say this is not just for the spiritual elite. In fact, in God's kingdom, there is no such thing as spiritual elite. That is a non-existent concept in God's kingdom. The gospel and the kingdom is for, is for ones who are like little children. That's what Jesus said. The gospel belongs to ones such as these. And he was speaking of little children. Uh, the kingdom belongs 
to one such as these. So that privilege to know and walk closely with Christ is available to anyone. It literally is. Anyone from any background, any level of spiritual knowledge, any level of experience with God is no restriction. That um, availability to encounter God is for anyone who will seek after him. That privilege of seeking after him through Christ. As God said through Jeremiah, if you will seek me with all your heart, you will find me. Those other things that I mentioned aren't bad. The financial uh, security, the, uh, the entertainment, the pleasure, they aren't, they aren't inherently evil things. But they have to be in their right place. And they have to be second to God or third behind God uh, who's at the top or further down the list. Matthew six thirty three says, seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. God cares about those other things. They're not irrelevant to him, but they have to be uh, further down the line, and he has to be in number one place. A third ingredient for spiritual renewal, and I bunched three things together because I feel that they are a set is humility, confession, and repentance. Humility, confession, and repentance. Through Nehemiah so far, as you've gone through this series together, there's been plenty of detail about the the rebuilding of the walls and the the, uh, return to the city and restoring Jerusalem as a place of uh, safe dwelling. And that rebuilding phase and who did it and how the exiles came back and how they resisted their enemies and how Nehemiah led well. He was a great leader and the favor that God gave them against Sanballat and Tobiah and so on. But we now have this long prayer prayed by the spiritual leaders of the community uh, of exiles. And these Levites led the people in publicly acknowledging to God their mistakes and their sins. They publicly acknowledged to God. They confessed their sins. They cried out to him. They recounted the stories of his faithfulness as well. They looked back on their history. They said, look at all the ways God's been good. Look at all the ways he brought us out of slavery. Look at how we messed it up. Look at how we torpedoed the whole thing. And they acknowledged that they had fallen away from him. They acknowledged they had rebelled against him. And it had led to a period of captivity. Their sin had been what caused them to go into captivity. Brothers and sisters, I believe there is something of that practice of confession. It's woven into the Anglican tradition, but somehow it can slip away from us where we maybe easily say those words, the things that we should have done that we've not done, the sins of omission and commission. But do we allow the Holy Spirit to search our hearts and to really bring to the fore, bring to the light that which needs to be confessed and have a position of humility before God and one another. We see these exiles, these returned exiles, coming in great humility and brokenness before God, seeking to acknowledge and to confess their sin and put it right before God. And we see in later chapters, there were specific actions that they took in terms of dealing with intermarriage and and those who had intermarried being separated and so on. It was really drastic the way they dealt with their sin. These are very great humbling moments But I believe they are essential for us to see that every single one of us stands on the same ground before Christ. None of us can be in a loftier position than anyone else. We come, all of us broken, all of us sinners, all of us with things that we are ashamed of, attitudes, actions, practices, habits, thoughts, words that grieve God's spirit. And there's no one in the body of Christ, not the clergy, not full-time Christian workers, not uh, those that you might think of as old and saintly. None of us is more pleasing to God than any other. We are all the same. We are all wretched sinners who have experienced the grace and the forgiveness and the welcome of a forgiving God. And so by confession, by humility, by repentance, and even public confession, even in, in small groups sharing, I've had a tough week. I've, I've been angry with my kids, or I've I've been having hateful thoughts towards my neighbor or whatever it might be. I've slandered somebody in the church. I need to confess and repent before my community. It might be a small group. It might be 
At times, it'll even be before the whole church. So we take responsibility for our sins. We come at a place of level ground at the feet of Jesus, and we confess and repent. It's incredibly clear from this story, but also through many other biblical accounts and throughout church history, that the revival God wants to bring will be accompanied by significant repentance and turning away from sin. It is just the pattern of how God works. And it may feel unpleasant at the time, but it is the process of walking in the light, of moving into the light, just as he is in the light. Now, Nehemiah and the people had worked on rebuilding the walls and the temple because that was the level on which God had revealed his purposes to them. The city of Jerusalem, the city of David, the great temple where people would offer sacrifice and once a year receive atonement through offerings. That's what they understood as being the the pinnacle of how they would encounter God. And the revival they experienced as they read the law of God, as they confessed, as they repented of their sins, was powerful and real, but it was not lasting. It didn't stick. You see at the end of the book of Ezra, there was a significant repentance. But then just a few short years later, they're doing it again with Nehemiah and they had completely drifted. They lacked in this area of the law of God being written in their hearts. It was written on scrolls. In fact, it got lost. And then they found it and they read it and they were shocked by what it said, by its implications. It was not written on their hearts. So they were definitely eager. They were definitely earnest. They were um, wearing sackcloth and they put soil on their heads and, and they were fasting and praying and crying and weeping. They were not messing around. Their earnest praise and confession and worship was deep and real, but it was not lasting. It didn't hold. It didn't lead to sanctification, what we call sanctification. Not too long after the revival in Nehemiah's day, the walls of the city, the temple, their repentance declined and the drift happened and the inevitable slide back into sin and compromise happened all over again. And God's heart was broken. But we don't live in the days of that old covenant, that old uh, understanding. We live in the days of the new covenant. We live in a time where the, uh, the law of God has been written in our hearts. And it has been sealed and guaranteed by the Holy Spirit. And in the new covenant, God is at work and he's working from the inside out. He's working in Christ church from the inside of hearts out into vision out into the community. He's transforming us inside so that a great outer work can be done. Ephesians 2.10 says, we're God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works. So the good works is definitely on his agenda, but note the clause just before that, created in Christ Jesus. There's something about that, that mystery and the miracle of being born again in Jesus Christ and being sanctified by him that produces works that are not just noble acts that have no kingdom value, but they are good works prepared in advance for us to walk in because we are in Christ. He has created us in Christ and the inner transformation is followed by all kinds of good works, loving the lost, caring for the poor, reaching out to those at the margins, might be refugees, it might be others, those less cared for, those who are infirm and sick, those who are uh, isolated, and bringing peace and reconciliation to broken relationships. All of these things flow from his life within us. So we we aren't building physical walls around a city. In general, that's not what our project is. But God is building his kingdom in every single one of us and out from us into the world. So their confession and their revival was short-lived. It didn't stick. It didn't hold in that sense. But we have a revival and a process of confession and repentance that leads to interchange that is lasting. It goes in, the Spirit does his work, and we become more like Jesus. And I want to encourage us that we return to that place of confession and repentance often and regularly, not just a moment 25 years ago when I gave my life to Christ or a moment 10 years ago when I had a a rift with somebody and we finally had a chance to deal with it. But every day and every week saying, God, is there anything in me today that you want to put your finger on? 
Is there anything you want to highlight? And we don't need to get bogged down in that. It's a few moments of quiet, letting the Holy Spirit bring conviction and then dealing with anything he brings up. And I think that should be absolutely normative in our practice. As you seek God for renewal in Christ Church at this time, I commend that to you, that those would not be rare things in the church, but those would be frequent practices. Tim touched on this last Sunday, but it, it might be that there are relationships in the church that need to be put right and mended. Um, maybe there's areas of hidden sin or compromise that no one else knows about, but you know about, you and God know about. Those things need to be brought into the light. It could be neglect for God's word and, and prayer. There's some things that seem to us really big sins and other things that seem minor the key, they, they are all sins. Anything that grieves God's heart is a sin, no matter whether it's viewed as scandalous or low key in human terms. But ours is to allow the Holy Spirit to bring that to the fore and to deal with it as he asks us to. So are you seeking a new season of renewal, a new movement of the Holy Spirit in Christ Church, a new vision for the church? Well, I urge you, brothers and sisters, I urge you, friends, to allow the Holy Spirit to search and reveal anything that he wants to put his finger on so that a great work can be done internally that will lead to great work externally. Christ church and no church needs to be a church of perfect people. That concept doesn't exist. Again, it's a concept that doesn't exist in God's kingdom. It's an impossibility to have a perfect church or a perfect people. But Christ Church does need to be a church of people who keep saying yes to that searchlight of the Holy Spirit so that God's inner cleansing leads to that extension of his kingdom. The fourth point and the last point I want to make about uh, essential ingredients for spiritual renewal is fasting and prayer. And um, in verse 1 of chapter 9, it says the people of Israel were assembled with fasting and in sackcloth and with earth on their heads. They were praying and crying out to God. Well, I think the sackcloth and the earth on their heads is something we can leave in the, the old covenant. I think that was a feature of the old covenant. It was how they showed their um, repentance and sorrow over their sins. And we don't see that continued in the New Testament. But we do see fasting and prayer continue in the New Testament. In fact, Jesus expressly teaches them in the Sermon on the Mount, they're taught in the Gospels, they're taught in the Epistles, that prayer and fasting are to be part of our Christian life. I know these things are hard. I know prayer and fasting are very hard. I personally find prayer not so hard, but fasting just incredibly challenging. Anything more than about one meal I find is, is difficult, and I, I get so distraught over the fact that I feel like I haven't eaten for weeks. Um, so that's something I'm working on, but I commend to us the practice, the regular practice of prayer combined with fasting. We know that God has chosen to act here on earth through the catalyst of prayer. It's how he has constructed his kingdom, how he acts in the world. Second Chronicles 7.14 was read out last week, but I want to read it again. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways. And I will hear from heaven, and will forgive their sin, and heal their land. It's that same set of essential ingredients or conditions that we've been speaking about. They pray, they humble themselves with confession and repentance, they seek me, and they turn from sin. Well, God's promise in response to these steps is so powerful, so beautiful. He says, I will hear, I will forgive, I will heal. I will hear, I will forgive, I will heal. So where fasting comes into play is not as an extra lever or gear to try to convince God that we are really serious about him or about the things of the kingdom. He knows our hearts. He knows if we are serious or not. We don't need to try to persuade him. How I understand fasting is it's really signaling to ourselves that we are setting apart time and energy and effort and pushing away some other things so that we can zero in on the things of God. 
So really, fasting shuts out some pleasures and distractions that could keep us from tuning into God, from locking in on God. It heightens our spiritual sensitivity so that our spirit is not dulled by food. Food is is definitely a duller of the spirit. It causes you to feel temporarily satisfied and quietens the cravings of your inner being. And there are other forms of pleasure that do the same thing, entertainment or um, certain other pleasures that you would enjoy. And so whatever it is you're fasting, by putting that aside, we're dialing in more clearly into God's channel. We're listening for his still small voice. I want to encourage you to add to your patterns of prayer some patterns or discipline of fasting as well. If you find it hard like me, start really small. Just fast for one meal and use that time or a portion of that time to pray and allow that to be your heart turning towards God and then take it from there. Maybe fast one meal a day for two or three days in a row and then take it up another notch, maybe the next week or the next month. Try fasting two meals a day and so on. And by that, we grow that muscle of fasting and combining it with prayer. So fasting and prayer is the fourth one. Let me list them again, these ingredients that I believe God wants to highlight for Christ Church at this time. The first one is God's mercy and the sovereign factor. The second ingredient for spiritual renewal is our part, seeking after God, the crucial factor. Uh, The third one is humility, confession, repentance. What we see the whole of chapter 9 is about, and even... It goes on in other parts of Nehemiah, the confession and repentance that they walked in. And the fourth one is fasting and prayer as that catalyst for God's activity on earth. As you do these things, as we do these things, you do them there, we we do them here as well. I believe that we will see God moving and speaking in a way that we have never experienced before. I believe that he will hear, he will forgive, he will heal and restore and cause the church to be a bright light for his praise and glory. I'd like to finish by joining you in the the words of this Lysig prayer, the leading your church into growth prayer that you have been praying as a church. And I absolutely uh, ask God to do the same things as you have been asking for. Let's pray. God of mission, who alone brings growth to your church, Send your Holy Spirit to give vision to the planning, wisdom to the actions, and power to the witness of your people in Christ Church Bushmead. Help the church to grow in numbers, in spiritual commitment to you, and in service to the local community, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. God bless you.